Welcome to episode 46 of Lizzie's Bedtime Stories. My guest is L'Oreal Lake, and she's going to be reading from her next novel, which I'm terribly excited to hear. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Liz. I'm glad to be here. I know. It was, it was, it was terribly exciting to meet you at GC last, and I, I'm glad that we finally have hit the point in the year where we actually are doing the interview and whatnot that, that I asked you to do that long ago. Well, we, we did talk about it a lot these last few months, and it's been it's been great so that we finally got a day that we could sit down and do this. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the, the stars aligned, and it was all good. And um, Skype cooperated eventually. Yes, it did. You know, it, it, you know, success is about perseverance. You have to keep on going for it. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. So, uh, be- I'm sorry, say that again? I was going to say, that sure can be true. Absolutely. So let my listeners know which book you're reading from and give them a little bit of a setup for the reading you're about to do, and then you can start the reading. All right. This is from the novel Jump the Gun that just came out last summer. It's the fourth book in the Gun series. Um, the Gun series it takes place in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Minnesota. And our main hero is Des Riley, and she's uh, um, career police officer at this time of this book uh, she's a sergeant in in the patrol area and so uh, here's the first chapter Mm -hmm. of the novel Uh, I'll just start reading the first chapter go ahead yay (laughs) thanks Liz (laughs) Dez Riley tightened her grip on the stock of a sawed off shotgun she scanned the area outside the bank through thick plate glass windows while concentrating her peripheral vision on the hostages. As she shifted out of sight to the side of the window, the loaded handgun in the pocket of her long gray duster bumped against the wall. She carried replacement magazines in the other pocket of her coat. She stood above a man who lay lifeless on the floor, the sticky fluid on his chest a clear testament to his recent death. Glimpsing movement through the window of the brightly lit bank, she backed away from line of sight and shouted, Hurry up, Bobby. It's time to get the hell out of here. A siren sounded in the distance. Dez saw the vehicles barreling their way. That's it, boys, she yelled. We're out, now. She dropped to one knee next to the bank guard and pulled at the keys hooked on his belt. They came away attached to a long metal wire. Hastily, she unclipped the ring and slid it across the floor. Two men clad in black clothing and black ski masks vaulted the chest level counter and scurried across the open lobby area. One carried two heavy satchels. The other scooped up the keys, stopped at a side door labeled employees only, and looked back to Dez. He fumbled until he found the correct key, unlocked the door and hollered, come on, Dez. With one last glance toward the bank parking lot and approaching vehicles, Dez catapulted up from one knee and followed. In four running steps, she came to a trio of customers lying silent and face down near the teller window, fingers threaded behind their heads. With a powerful spring, she leapt over them, blasted through the doorway, and chased down a long hallway after her companions. She skidded around a turn that was so sharp, she hit the wall and felt it give a little. Cheap, crappy construction, she thought. She pushed off and hurtled down the hall, feeling elation bubble up. Bobby and Frederick were already out of the bank, and she was hard on their heels. They ran for a beat-up Chevy Junker 20 yards away, wrenched open the doors, and fell into it. Des slouched in the back seat, panting, jubilant, the weapons in her pockets pressing against her hip and back. She laughed aloud. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. Bobby let out a whoop as Frederick beat on the steering wheel with the palms of his hands. Sweet, Frederick said. He looked back toward Des and gave her a thumbs up. All three of them laughed out loud like little kids on Christmas Day. Des peered out the window, scanning the area, waiting. She examined her watch. As close as she could tell, more than 20 seconds had passed since they vacated the building. She stared at the back of the bank until she finally saw what she expected. A black-clad figure crept low around the crumbling block foundation. She exited the exited the car and leaned back against the junker with her arms crossed over her chest. Hey, she said, we are so gone, Zeller. The SWAT team member stripped off one of his gloves and threw it to the ground. His dark helmet and protective glasses obscured his angry features, but even with all the gear, 
Des could tell it was Zeller by the way he stood. Shit, he spat out. How the hell did you do that? Des just grinned. Bobby and Frederick emerged from the Chevy Malibu as the entire SWAT team, two commanders, and six tactical trainers converged on the area behind the faux bank. One by one, the three bank customers filed out of the bank, followed by the guard with paint spattered all over his chest. Lieutenant Mortensen clicked a stopwatch. Exercise complete. Bank robbers one, SWAT zero. Want to tell me what happened here? Zeller banged the stock of his red dummy assault rifle on the ground. One of the other members of the team said, There's no way they could have got out that quick. Not with the goods, anyway. Bobby pointed to the black satchels on the Chevy's passenger seat. He grabbed one and threw it at the feet of Willie Thorpe, the team leader. Thorpe squatted, unzipped the bag, and rummaged around inside. This isn't all of it. Bobby grinned. Yeah, so? You didn't get all of it, so you failed. You didn't get any of us, Thorpe, so I'd have to say you're the bigger failure here. He glanced toward Dez, then Frederick. You guys, Dez said, you guys have got to get over the idea that all crooks are greedy and stupid. Some aren't. Zeller pointed at Steve Hart, the bank guard. You didn't follow protocol, Riley. Since when was shooting him in the plan? Yeah, Hart brushed at the drying paint on his chest. Damn, you messed this up. Dez chuckled. Perfect example of the best laid plans going awry. Any good criminal is going to adapt. You know the old saying that no battle plan survives first contact. Same thing goes with any organized crime. Get used to it. Zeller's face was so red, Des thought he was going to pop a vein. He kicked his gear and turned away. Bobby laughed out loud. Sore loser. Screw you, Thorpe said under his breath, his lips curled up in a look of disdain. He glared at the three criminals like he wanted to kill them on the spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amanda Mortensen stepped between Bobby and Thorpe. Everybody over to the shack, and let's do a post-mortem on this. The failed special weapons and tactics team grabbed their gear and moved as one, double time, toward their destination. Des watched the dejected crew's boots moving swiftly, left, right, left, right, in harmony like a pack of black ants. She felt sympathy for them, but on the other hand, they'd been too slow. This wasn't like a baseball catcher donning equipment for a tough inning in the field. The stakes were life and death. She knew how much gear they had to get into. Kevlar vests, thigh and forearm protectors, elbow and knee pads, shin guards, the outer uniform, heavy boots, and their new handy-dandy cut-resistant neoprene Damascus gloves. And that was just the apparel. Flashlight, baton, radio and headpiece, cuffs, eyewear, knives, Tactical lights, periscope on a stick, ammo packs, the list went on and on. If Dez were ever selected for SWAT, the number one thing she would practice on her own would be dressing and arming with absolute efficiency. Things move fast in SWAT situations, and this brand new team had just learned it the hard way. Some fellow officers thought Dez Riley, at 35, was a little too old to be volunteering for SWAT training but her experience and fitness belied her age. She stood six feet tall in stocking feet and was broad-shouldered and muscular, with her long black hair French braided and the braid tucked up tight against her head. It was easy to confuse her with the men of the unit, that is, until you got close and saw the high cheekbones, dark brows, and bright blue eyes. Those eyes scanned the area constantly and took in everything around her. Des fell in next to Bobby and elbowed him in the side. You're going to get yourself killed. They'll be out for blood now. So, a little splat ball paint never hurt anybody, even if the bank guard took it with a lot of extra whining. The shack was a good 300 yards away, past a fake supermarket, a three-story concrete structure, and several towers from which the SWAT trainers could survey the area. The mass of officers moved beyond all that and entered the shack, a command post in the center of the 80-acre training facility. Bobby and Frederick cut over toward the men's room while Des proceeded through a door at the right. The SWAT team and trainers filed into a classroom through a door to the left. The cops who'd played the three customers in the bank guard would describe the course of the action to the assault team just as if it had happened in real life. The robbers would keep their secrets to themselves as they ready for another situation. Des's coordinator, Nick Boulay, one of the SWAT team's longtime trainers said, good job today, Riley. He glanced behind her and in a low voice asked, everything going okay? You having any uh, issues coming up?
He just looked at him coolly. Commander Malcolm tell you to keep an eye on me? Yep, good supervisors look out for their best officers. She bristled and wanted to say a few angry words, but she couldn't deny that her commander had looked after her in the past. In the aftermath of her partner's death several years earlier, Des had suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. Malcolm dealt with her problems with real grace, but since then, she'd done the therapeutic work to master the situation, and she was no longer troubled. She wished the topic would stop coming up. Forcing a grin, she said, I'm having a hell of a good time, Nick. Don't worry about me. I'm on your side. Just remember that. Thanks. It means a lot coming from you. I'd like to see you advance, Des. I've always respected your work, and if it were up to me, you ought to get a SWAT assignment. I don't know what'll happen, though. You deserve this. She felt her face heat up. She agreed with him, but instead said, The brass seem to think I'm a hothead, that I can't be trusted in a really tough situation. If I was in a tough spot, you'd be the go-to gal for me. That's not how some of the guys feel. Well, that makes them idiots in my book. Before she got a chance to answer, her teammates hustled into the room and shut the door. Nick took a deep breath, and only then did he share a moment of laughter. You guys did good, even better than I expected. He clapped Bobby Rowski on the shoulder. Okay, let's get to work. Any minute now, we'll be getting a new team member for your despicable little exploits. Des smiled. Despicable exploits. The day wasn't even half over, and she was already having fun. Do you want me to stop there? That's perfect. It's perfect. Okay. That's, is that, that's enough time? Yes. You know, I, I, I dig it because when I, I had read the book, because I, I am reviewing it for your interview, when I read it, I was like, wait, isn't this person supposed to be a cop? Why is she uh -huh. shooting people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you go back and you read it, you know, it's like the sticky things on his chest, a testament to his recent death, but I didn't ever say the blood or anything. I kind of I, I kind of did a fast um, shuffle there. I, and it was funny because I first read this at the very first GCLS con in 2005. That's how long it took me to write this book. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, I first read this opening scene to everybody, and they were like, oh, Paul, oh, my God. In the middle of it, somebody said, are you sure you're reading about Des Riley? <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, she, she's having a pretty good time there. I, yeah, I, I dig it. I dig her, I dig her as a person. And I, over the years, I've read a lot of lesbian fiction that includes um, police officers who are characters. And mm -hmm. it's interesting to see how the tensions are always there between the boys and the girls on the, you know, on separate sides. And, you know, with Catherine V. Forrest, you got to see what, how closeted uh, the cop mm -hmm. was and uh, what her relationship was with uh, her coworkers and her partner and the things that she had to cope with. But still you see the subtle changes over time when, when uh, what is it like now, the back and forth, it's, it's teasing and whatnot, but it's, it doesn't have that same visceral mm -hmm. edge, like you it do is. not belong here. Yeah, yeah, I think it's changed a lot. I have lots of um, cop friends, both male and female, and, and it's a whole different environment now. Women are respected in a different way. Mm -hmm. Well, as long as they can do the job. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I think it, it would be instructive for somebody to, like, obviously, if I, at the time I would do a historical from the 70s to the present and, and seeing the, what has changed and also it has stayed the same. Mm -hmm. So I'm really pleased that you came on the show and gave a little test of, I, I didn't even know that this novel was so long in the making, but it's definitely worth picking up and I appreciate you doing the reading on the show. Thank you. It was good fun.